Good morning, South Mississippi. For, I'd like to welcome you to our second stroke support group of February 10th, 2021. Normally for our stroke support group, we would have to brave this wet, cold, rainy weather to come into the hospital to participate. But we are very lucky that Sarah Duffy and her amazing team, we've created a new platform with Facebook Live, so you can attend through the comfort of your own home. And we're also lucky today to be in the office at the Southern Mississippi Heart Center. February is Heart Month, so Dr. Zayad has taken time out of his demanding schedule to talk with us about similarities between heart attack and stroke attacks. Thank you, Dr. Zayad. Thank you, Sarah, for this invite, and I'm very glad to talk to our patients in Jackson County and on the Mississippi Gulf Coast about heart disease and stroke. And I will start with a somewhat have been presenting in all my talks over the last 25 years, and this slide shows the scope of the problem for Mississippi. Mississippi leads the country with regards to mortality from heart disease in both men and women. important risk factors for heart disease, we need to be aware that there are some risk factors that could be modifiable and some that we can't control or non-modifiable risk factors. When we look at the modifiable risk factors, these are primarily high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, physical inactivity, obesity and sedentary lifestyle, and diet. All these risk factors we can control. And by reducing the number of uncontrolled risk factors we have, we reduce our risk of having a heart attack or stroke. Now, what are the non-modifiable risk factors? And these are primarily age. As we get older, the likelihood of coronary artery disease and stroke increases. And the sex. Women, on the average, will present about 10 years later than men. And because of that, women's heart attacks tend to be more complex because they are older and they have more comorbidities. The last thing is our family history, which is something we cannot control, but with the majority of risk factors being modifiable, there is a lot of options that we can do in order to minimize our risk. So I would like all my patients to know five important numbers. The first one is the body mass index. The BMI, or body mass index, is basically a measure for the amount of fat that our body has, taking in consideration the patient's height and weight. The ideal body mass index should be less than 25. Body mass index over 30 puts us in the category of obesity, which significantly increases our risk. The second measure, or the second number we need to be aware of, is the waist, the waist to hip ratio, or the actual waist measurement. This should be measured at the level of the belly button, and a waist measurement of over 35 in women or over 40 in men increases our risk for having cardiovascular disease. The third important number is the blood pressure. Blood pressure, as you all know, is called the silent killer because a lot of patients walk around with blood pressures in 160, 170, 180, and they have no symptoms. And yet, when we start treating the blood pressure, they start having all the symptoms because of side effects related to the drugs that we use. We can always find the drug that suits the patient, and it doesn't mean that you're having side effects that you should stop taking the medication. Discuss it with your physician, and you can always find an alternative of the drug that did give you the, the problems with another drug that can actually be better tolerated by you. The number for blood pressure for all comers is less than 120 over 80. This is the optimal blood pressure for everybody. Unfortunately, some patients will not do well at this level of blood pressure, and we have to be very careful lowering the blood pressure gradually from the high levels they came with until we achieve the optimal measurements. The fourth number is cholesterol. Cholesterol, as we all know, is an important risk factor for both heart attacks and strokes. Circulating lipid particles, which are basically somewhat of a toxicity, toxic to the body, they tend to deposit under the vessel wall lining, leading to the formation of plaques, and these plaques can rupture, causing heart attacks and stroke. The three numbers you need to know for optimal cholesterol is your total cholesterol, less than 200, your LDL cholesterol, less than 100, and your HDL cholesterol, over 40. 
In the event that you've suffered a stroke or a heart attack or carotid disease or peripheral vascular disease, these numbers no longer stand. And we need to be more aggressive, lowering your cholesterol even further to LDL cholesterols of less than 70. And even now, there is a trend in Europe to lower the LDL cholesterol to less than 40. The fifth number is you need to know what your blood sugar is. If you're having elevated blood sugar in excess of 100 to 105, then you could fall in the category of prediabetes or a metabolic syndrome, which significantly increases your risk of heart attacks and stroke. So always try to know the, these five numbers. We'll go over them again, your body mass index, your waist size, your blood pressure, your cholesterol level, and your blood sugar. So a lot of patients would come to us in the office and ask us, what is my risk of having a heart attack? And we would give them the answer, but if you want to know about it, it's a very simple thing you can do. You can go on the website to the ACC AHA Cardiovascular Risk Calculator, and all you need to know is what your cholesterol level is and what your blood pressure is. You plug in your age, your gender, your race, your total cholesterol, your HDL cholesterol, your systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, or the lower number, and the, whether you're receiving treatment for high blood pressure or no, whether you have diabetes or no, or whether you smoke or no. And you push, calculate, and it will calculate your 10-year risk. Now, you can fall into one of three categories, either a low risk, where your risk of having a heart attack and, or stroke over the next 10 years is less than 10%, or an intermediate risk where your risk is between 10 and 20 percent or you can fall into a high risk category where your risk of having an event is over 20 percent. Patients in the intermediate risk and the high risk need to be more aggressive with the risk factors by controlling their blood pressure and the cholesterol, exercising, watching their diet. All these is like putting money in the bank. It will pay back later. If you don't do this important risk factor modulation the chances are that you may have one of these events in the future. So, a lot of patients would start having chest pain and they want to know, are they having a heart attack or is this something else? So the first thing you need to know is what are the classic symptoms and what are the atypical symptoms that occur when you're having a heart attack. For both men and women, the common presentation is with chest pain, pressure or tightness, occurring in the middle of the chest, radiating up into the neck or jaw, down your arms, or back into the back between the shoulder blades. Shortness of breath frequently accompanies the presentation of uh, heart attacks, and you can have pain that will radiate down into your arms, as mentioned earlier. Now, for women, the symptoms can sometimes be atypical, and all the women may experience is basically fatigue, and this could actually precede a heart attack by weeks to months but they can also present with nausea and feeling anxious or nervous. So if you have any of these symptoms, you need to be aware that that could be a manifestation of a heart attack. So what should you do if you think you might be having a heart attack? This is probably an extremely important point because you first you need to know what is a heart attack? What happens if you're having a heart attack? If you look at the slide here, that basically shows a picture of the artery, a section in the blood vessel that feeds your heart, it's called the coronary arteries. And what you're seeing there is there's plaque buildup in the wall. This plaque buildup takes years and years of bad particles, bad cholesterol particles, seeping in between the lining cells of the wall of the artery from the inside and depositing, forming a plaque. But what you need to know is the majority of at least 50% of the heart attacks will actually occur on blockages that are less than 50%, meaning that these are blockages that will be completely missed on a stress test. And we have all heard stories about patients having a stress test, passing with flying colors, and a week later they drop dead from a heart attack. And the reason is these patients have what we call a vulnerable plaque. A vulnerable plaque is a type of plaque that is rich in fat and has a very thin cap separating the fat inside the plaque from the bloodstream. Due to several conditions like stress, high blood pressure, and loss of flexibility of the artery with hardening, with age, these plaques can rupture, causing a little burst or a tear in the cover of the plaque, and that will trigger a clot formation. 
this clot will transform this 50% blockage that was not causing any problem a day or two earlier to a completely blocked artery, which is going to lead to a heart attack. So what happens if the artery is blocked? It is very important that you understand that time equals heart muscle, meaning that a blocked artery normally, the, the function of a blood vessel is to carry important nutrients, oxygen, and uh, blood to the heart muscle, okay? So if you don't, if you stay for a long time without seeking care, within 40 minutes, the heart cells start to suffer damage. And within six hours from the onset of a heart attack, a heart attack is complete. So it's very important that you present as soon as possible because there's a lot of things we can do to abort this heart attack and save you from significant complications and significant a disability related to completed heart attacks. This is a picture of a heart attack that is normal on the left and a heart attack that has suffered uh, scar tissue from an, from, a, from an MI. As you see the, 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 on the right side, the heart is dilated and there is a segment of the wall that is quite thinned because the heart muscle is now replaced by scar tissue. The heart's function is a pump. That's the main function is to pump blood to the important uh, organs in the body and losing that function is going to lead to complications related to the tissue perfusion and that will have other consequences. So there are certain things that you should do and more importantly things that you should not do if you think you're having a heart attack. What you should do if you think you're having a heart attack, the first thing is to call 911. Take an aspirin and chew it and swallow it and you try to sit in, on a couch or in a chair and wait for help to arrive. Do not, do not drive yourself to the hospital and do not have anybody drive you to the hospital. And the reason is the first 24 hours of a heart attack, patients are prone to develop bad heart rhythms. This is what could lead to what we call a cardiac arrest. If you are driving yourself to the hospital and you have a cardiac arrest, you could hurt yourself and hurt a lot of other people. And if somebody's driving you, there is nothing he can do for you if you're having a cardiac arrest sitting next to him. And more importantly, if you live in a remote area and this happens on the road, it's going to be difficult for the ambulance to locate you. So it's very important that you wait for the ambulance to come, let them take you to the emergency room. The third point is do not call your physician. The reason is physicians are busy during the daytime in their offices. It will take you a few minutes to get on the phone you may be kept on hold for a few more minutes, and the only thing a physician can tell you if you think you're having a heart attack is go to the emergency room. There's nothing we can offer you in the office if you're having a heart attack. So wasting valuable time is not going to help. So call 911, take an aspirin, and wait for the ambulance. When you arrive to the catheterization lab, or to the hospital in general, you are going to be rushed into the catheterization lab. Believe it or not, the shortest time of your heart attack is going to be in the cath lab. We have experienced cardiologists that are going to be able to reestablish flow in your artery within minutes from you arriving to the cardiac catheterization lab. The picture here on the top left shows a person who comes in with a heart attack involving his right coronary artery. And as you see, the blood flow stops abruptly. And we were able to get a wire across, do balloons, and finally put a stent to reach down the right corner of the slide where you see that the blood flow has been restored to the artery and the heart attack has been aborted. So please don't waste time. Now there is an important parameter, it's called the door to balloon time. And this is something that the ACC and the AHA looks at hospitals to see if they are achieving reperfusion or reopening the artery and reestablishing flow within this period of time. This is 90 minutes. The shorter the time to reperfusion, the lower your risk you have of dying from a heart attack or having disability related to your heart attack. So please, time equals heart muscle. What do we have at Singing River Hospital System? We have a complete comprehensive cardiology service. We have catheterization labs available that are open 24 seven. We have an open heart program with three capable surgeons. We have a congestive heart failure clinic to help patients with heart failure. We have a 
we are the one of the few hospitals that has the what we call the impeller catheter that's the smallest heart pump available and this allows us to perform a lot of complex procedures on patients that are considered high risk we also have a very good cardiac rehabilitation service we manage cardiac arrhythmias with pacemakers and defibrillators high blood pressure and high cholesterol and we also have the ability to place in certain devices to help with management of patients with congestive heart failure it's called the cardiomems device so what is the impeller catheter? The impeller catheter is the smallest heart pump to date. This is a very small device that we place through the femoral artery or the artery in the groin. We go up inside your heart and this is a pump that will actually suck the blood from the pumping chamber into the aorta, relieving the pressure on the heart and allowing for better tissue perfusion. We have a very large experience with the use of these devices, both in the cardiology service and the surgical program. And this allows us as cardiologists to perform high risk procedures on patients that are either felt to be high risk for surgery or who are refusing surgery. The second thing is the CardioMEMS device. This is a very small micro uh, miniaturized sensor that we actually play through the vein in the groin up into the uh, pulmonary artery which is the artery that feeds your lung this uh, transmits information to us about the pressures inside inside your pulmonary circulation and gives us an idea of how much fluid you have on, on board so for patients who are difficult to manage congestive heart failure we are able to record get recordings of their pressures on a daily basis and we can actually catch early changes in the filling pressures meaning that if they're starting to build up with fluid before they develop symptoms by a couple of weeks, we can actually identify that and treat them earlier with higher doses of diuretics. We, only the, we are all, the only heart program on the coast that has a structural heart program, and uh, the structural heart program that we have has been around for a few years, been quite successful. We are able to perform valve replacement surgery, what we call TAVR. This is performed by a cut down of the groin rather than by opening the chest. We are able to carry on procedures on the mitral valves if they are leaky and the patients are not good candidates for surgery. It's called mitral valve clip. We are also having uh, a, a program called the Watchman device placement, which is an occluder that we place in the left atrial appendage. That's a recess in the upper chamber of your heart. That is where blood clots tend to form in patients that have atrial fibrillation. That is a very common rhythm disorder. And uh, that would obviate the need of being on long-term blood thinner medications. And this is used in patients who are poor candidates for blood thinners, like those who have history of bleeding. The last thing is we have the ability to close uh, holes in the heart, uh, either what we call a patent foramen ovale or atrial septal defect, with devices that are actually performed through the groin and a very short hospital stay with patients going home. Within So a word or two about our catheterization lab. We have a total of five cath labs. They're state-of-the-art cath labs. We have highly experienced invasive and interventional cardiologists. We have been on, uh, 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 we have a lot of experience. We've been on work for over 20 years. Um, uh, the availability of the cath lab is 24-7, 365 days a, a year. And we are considered to be one of the top 10 hospitals with regards to door to balloon time. We have the ability to perform complex coronary interventions, as mentioned earlier, particularly now that we have the impeller device. And we are the only hospital in, in the Mississippi Gulf Coast that is performing what we call structural heart interventions, like I mentioned, the TAVR and the mitral valve clip and the Watchman device. So this is the other distressing slide, uh, and I know you are uh, either uh, survivors of stroke or family of survivors of stroke, but again, Mississippi is the leading uh, uh, state in the country with regards to the incidence of stroke. And on the average, Mississippi actually has 30% higher risk of stroke, primarily related to our bad diet, obesity, our smoking, and uncontrolled blood pressure. As you know, we are one of 11 states that falls in the stroke belt, and we have not been successful up to this point in, in controlling it. Now, it's very important that you know that the risk factors for a heart attack and for stroke are quite similar. 
And if you have had a heart attack, you are at risk of stroke. And if you've had a stroke, you are at risk of having a heart attack. And when you look at the different risk factors here, you find that high blood pressure and smoking are the leading risk factors for both conditions. Primarily hypertension or high blood pressure for stroke and primarily smoking for heart attacks. But controlling the risk factors, we are not going to differentiate between a heart attack or stroke. We just try to control all our risk factors. The five numbers I mentioned to you earlier, try to get them under control, and that will significantly minimize your risk of having an event in the near future. With regards to stroke, you all know uh, the importance of the signs. Okay, it's a be fast will stand for B for balance, feeling dizzy, okay? I, E for eye, if you have visual disturbances, blurring of the vision, double vision, seeing lines in the field of vision. F for face, drooping of the face, okay? Uh, uh, inability to smile or close your eyes tight on one side. A for arms, if you are unable to hold your arms up because one arm is weaker or one leg is weaker. And speech is garbled or, uh, or uh, what we call inability to find the correct words to express yourself. And finally, the most important thing for stroke, just like heart attacks, is time. You, as soon as you have any of these symptoms, you need to go to the emergency room. And the reason is there is new treatments that we can give, clot busting medications that would be quite effective in aborting strokes. Approximately 30% of the patients will actually have complete resolution of their symptoms. It's important for you to present within the first three hours because that's the time that is approved for the administration of the clot busting medicine TPA. And for the, as just like the heart, we have a door to balloon time of 90 minutes. The stroke is 60 minutes because the brain cells are obviously more sensitive to blood deprivation than the heart. It is important for you to know that 80% of strokes are preventable by controlling the risk factors. Physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, smoking, and most importantly, uncontrolled blood pressure. I was happy to talk to you about heart attacks and strokes, and I'll be glad to answer any questions.